Anyone wants to holler out? Bible. Bible. All right. 431, 431. I've found a friend who is all to me. I'm saved, saved, saved. Let's all stand together. 431 on that first together. I found a friend who is all to me. His love is ever true. I love to tell how he lived in me and what his grace can do for you. Saved by his power. Good to see you back in church tonight. And uh, and speaking of saved, uh, Madison got saved this morning. And a uh, teenage girl that visited, uh, Ricky's niece. Is that right? And uh, that's great. God's doing some good things in your family, you know that? That's great to see. And uh, rejoicing in that decision, praise the Lord. And looking forward to what the Lord has in store for us tonight. Thank you for being in church on Super Bowl Sunday night. And I uh, appreciate your faithfulness. Let's pray together, shall we? Heavenly Father, we bow together now in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the good service this morning, and thank you for the decisions that were made for thee, and we're thankful that Madison put her faith in Jesus Christ as her Savior. And Father, we enjoyed the afternoon, and we are now back for church this evening. Lord, we are bowed before you and ask you to meet with us tonight. You promised that you would be here when we gather together, and we pray that you'll minister to our hearts again this evening, and you know the needs of each and every individual that's here tonight. I pray you'd meet those needs. Bless the music. Honor the preaching of the Word of God once again to do your work that you would desire to accomplish in each one of us. May you be pleased with the service this evening now. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Yeah. You may be seated. It's a well of pure water when I'm thirsty and dry. It's bread when I'm hungry and worn. When the battle is raging, it's my faithful sword. Shelter from life's troubled storms. It's a light to my path and a lamp to my feet. When this road so dark you can't see. And I've not made a change in one word that it says. It sure made a change in me. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand is true from beginning to end. It's a solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it, now it keeps me from sin. 
when I think what it costs just to hold in my hand, I'm reminded that I owe a great debt to all of the martyrs who've gone to the stake, quoting it with their dying breath. Well, it's critics are many, many and believers are few, but one thing I've found to be true, if you find when you read it that there's something wrong, there's something wrong with you. This blessed old book that I hold in my hand is true from beginning to end. It's solid foundation where I firmly stand. Sin kept me from it, now keeps me from sin. Sin kept me from it, now it keeps me So true. Let's turn to 150 together. 150. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living in whatever men may say. Let's sing that first together. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that He is living whatever men may say. I see His hand of mercy. I need him, he's always near. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives, he lives, salvation to him poured. You ask me how I know he announcements for us now listen carefully if you would uh regular schedule uh this week uh wednesday night a midweek service 7 p.m back here in the auditorium uh continuing through second peter on wednesday night and then of course the other activities through the week uh next sunday is i love missions sunday uh pray for brother hendrickson uh he was scheduled to be with us sunday uh brother neil uh, he called me last night he's in the hospital uh he is uh, been dehydrated, and uh, he also has pneumonia. And uh, so please pray for uh, Brother Neil. He just isn't sure he's going to be able to make it on Sunday. And so uh, let's pray for him. I told him I'd check with him later in the week and see how he's doing. But I appreciate you praying uh, for Brother Hendricksman. And then reminder, February 20th, the, the chili cook-off, pie bake-off. And uh, that's always a great night. That's a Saturday evening at 5 o'clock. And so uh, plan to be there. There'll be a sign-up sheet for that, I'm sure, very soon that you'll be able to sign up and uh, get prepared for that on February the 20th, okay? Uh, did get an email uh, forwarded to me from John and Emily uh, down in Uganda. He said, uh, John did this. He said, well, I'm still having issues with this Internet, but I guess I can't complain too much as we're pretty far out here. I uh, hope all is going well. We are in the house with the generator running for hopefully another hour. It has been plenty warm, but we're getting used to it. Emily had, had a little bit of a heat rash, but actually the working hand stuff uh, seems to help. I got bit by a spider, was amazed at the size of the holes, uh, got that cleaned up and kept some triple antibiotic on it. 
looks better today, just bruised and swollen a bit. They tore out all the bushes in front of our house and built a brick wall completely around the compound. Hopefully, that'll really help with snakes and, and people, okay? <laughs> he said, so much to say, but I'm typing everything on my phone. I'll hopefully get an email out from my computer tomorrow. Love y'all, Brother John. So uh, good to hear they're getting acclimated <laughs> to the situation and uh, continue to pray for them. All right, and uh, we'll take just a moment, look around to see. We have a young man visiting right here, and uh, tell us who you are and where you're from. Oh, great. Sure. Great. You're the man. All right. Okay, good. Introduction and free commercial all in one. How about that? <laughs> And uh, good job, Tyler. All right. Good to meet you. I heard you were coming to town, and uh, good to have you visiting. It's uh, good to see a young man in church on Super Bowl Sunday night. That's, uh, that says a lot about your Christianity, my friend. That's great. Amen. Uh, if you'll take just a moment and fill that card out, we appreciate it. In a little bit, we have the offering, and just put that card in if you would, and keep the pen as our gift to you for coming this evening. All right. Let's give Tyler a warm welcome, shall we? Oh, wait a minute. Barbara has somebody with her tonight. I didn't see that. BJ. Your niece, and we just call you niece, or do you have a name? Jewel. Wow, that's pretty. Great. We can remember that. All right. Jewel, good to have you tonight. Did you get a card yet? Great. They got there. Couldn't care of you. Great. You. Thank you, Jewel. Sorry, I missed you. Uh, overlooked you there. Let's give Jewel a warm welcome as well, shall we? That's great. All right, now we'll hear from the choir. Number 11, number 11 in your hymnal, he is mine. Number 11, one, one, long before the fall of man, God designed a master plan. Let's sing that first together. Long before the fall of man, God designed a master plan. He exchanged a sinner for a sinless one. Jesus led. Oh, 
mercy and his grace. He's prepared for us a place. The words cannot describe the matchless beauty there. We will praise the perfect lamb. We have an anniversary to celebrate, and uh, everything okay here? All right. <laughs> and uh, Jeremiah and Charlotte Hodge had an anniversary yesterday, I believe it was, and uh, February sixth. And uh, you're uh, they're they're new, just say baptized, so they don't know how this works. You have to come up here, okay? So come on up. They're both looking at me like, yeah, yeah, okay. Come on down, all right. We celebrate your anniversary here. Come right on up here to the platform. No, you got your white flowers for anniversary. Card you get card and get flowers. You just hand in and take it off the road and stuff. And we're gonna <laughs> and we're gonna sing for you, all right? You got Lisa? Sure. Wonderful. That's great. All right. Well, it's I Love My Church Month, and we, I think they figured out the technical problems. And uh, part of that was the uh, live stream and running the video through the same computer as the live, it was live streaming. And so they had, he's kind of got that all divided out. Brother Dean spent the afternoon getting that ready. We're going to hear a testimony tonight from Pete and M. Abrams. And um, the Abrams, Brother Pete, six years was it six years on a dinner day that you and his wife started coming? Uh, Emma Norman knocked on their door and gave him a flyer to come. And uh, so if anything about the Abrams you don't like, you see Emma Norman. And she's <laughs> responsible for that. And uh, that's great. That's great. Uh, they've been a real blessing to our church. And uh, they both are in the choir. In fact, Emma's in nursery this evening uh, serving there, a Sunday school teacher. Uh, Brother uh, Pete takes care of our yard here at the church, and uh, they just serve any way they can. And uh, Pete's uh, uh, notorious and uh, giving out tracts everywhere he goes, uh, giving the gospel out, always ready to give a witness. Uh, walking into a restaurant uh, one day, and I saw on most all the tables there's a gospel tract. Uh, sitting with the, you know, the, the salt, the pepper, and all that stuff is. He's got a tract stuck in there, and I, I just thought to myself, Pete Abrams must have been here. And uh, that's, that's what he does. And uh, we love the Abrams. We're going to find out why they love their church. But let's sing our song together, and then we'll hear their video. All right? The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 
Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. All right, Brother Dean, are you ready? When I uh, was a child growing up, I wasn't from a Christian. Christian home, but I thank God for my godly mother, grandmother, and grandfather on my mother's side that uh, prayed that we could go to church and we were allowed to go. And I love that Bible Baptist has a bus ministry because I was one of those bus kids, and I love that fact about it. I love that. Uh, if there's anywhere you want to be plugged in to, to serve, talk to pastor. He always will find something for you to do from the nursery to whatever. And uh, Another thing I like about coming to Bible Baptist is the turkey dinner day. Actually, that's how we began uh, coming here. Uh, we were going through some turmoil and we changed churches and we ended up going to a lot of churches. And um, I just sat down at a table one night. We went to several and we couldn't find a place to go as a family. And that's what I wanted. So we sat down and we prayed. And I said, Lord, I said, you have to show us where you want us to go. I said, you give us a map right to the door. That way we don't, we know exactly that's where you want us to be. And just so happened um, that next week, a uh, little Emma Norman, which my name is Emma. And uh, there's another story about that, but I won't go on all that. But um, she came knocking on the door and she said, uh, hi, I'd like to invite you to Bible Baptist Church. She said, we're having a turkey dinner day and we'd love for you to come. And uh, I know what we believe. We believe in the King James Version and and lo and behold, on the back of that, it was a note from the Lord from little Emma saying, you know, here's, you know, the plan of salvation was on the back of the, the track and uh, basically a number and an address right to Bible Baptist uh, uh, Church. And we've been coming for almost, I think, six years now, and I love it. And I just praise God that he allows us to be a part of the ministry. So we get to participate in the choir and Turkey Dinner Day, of course, and uh, the nursery river. You know, we need to serve. You know, we're servants here for him, and I just give him the glory for allowing us to be a part of that. And I love the fact that our pastor's not ashamed to preach the word. Uh, you know, that's another thing that keeps us coming back because we've grown so much as a family uh, because of Pastor Slayball's preaching, and he just opens the word. And sometimes it hurts, but sometimes it heals too. And I just, I just thank God that uh, he led us here, and I just love everybody at Bible Baptist, and they're just like our family. They are our family, so that's why I keep coming back. Uh, okay, I guess it's my turn after all that. Um, uh, I'm pleased to be here, and um, I would be with my maker if uh, it hadn't been for the love and the, uh, the things that uh, I received from uh, a lot of the people. Uh, I was uh, saved in uh, 1972 on June 5th in the back of a Rambler station wagon. Um, uh, by uh, well, by Lord Jesus, but uh, I was led to the Lord by uh, Pastor Hat. And uh, if you're watching, Pastor, uh, your seed still remains. And uh, we've uh, become a, a, a Christian family. I, uh, I love coming here to uh, Bible Baptist, and uh, uh, we love the people here, and uh, we uh, I love the uh, preaching here, and um, it's. Uh, it's great to uh, uh, be a member here. We, like she said, we've been here for about six years. We came on a, a turkey dinner Sunday, and uh, we were so filled with the word that we didn't have to have dinner. We went home. We were filled. So uh, uh, that, that, that was really a blessing. And uh, we uh, served in that venue uh, every year now since. And um, I, I mow the grass for the church, and uh, occasionally I sing in the choir. I'm an usher. Uh, uh, I love serving the Lord, and I, I serve with a grateful heart. And uh, uh, we just love being here at Bible Baptist Church. Amen. 492, would you turn with me to 492? Jesus Christ has made to me all I need, all I need. Let's stand when you find that. 492. 
On that first together, Jesus Christ is made to me. All I need, all I need, he alone is all my plea. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness is very hard. My redemption full and free, he is all I need. He redeemed me when he died. All I need, all I need, I with him was crucified. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness is very hard. My redemption, full and free, He is all I need. Amen. Greet one another. Make somebody feel welcome, especially our guest. We'll come back and sing the last stanzas together. the treasure of my soul. All I need, all I need, He hath cleansed and made me whole. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness is very My redemption full and free, He Sing that forth with me if you would. Jesus is my all in all, all I need, all I need. On that fourth, Jesus is my all in all, all I need, all I need. While he keeps, I cannot fall. He is all I need. Wisdom, righteousness, and power, holiness is very my redemption full and free he is all i need let's all sing that last together when we get to the chorus i'll have the instruments drop out and we'll sing that a cappella on that last together glory glory to the lamb by his Holiness. 
as this very hour. My redemption, full and free, He is all I need. Amen. All right, be seated. We are going to try to show you the BPS video that we didn't get through this morning. So, fellas, come on up and have a seat, if you will. Be careful there. I don't know what's on there. Is that a leaf or something on the chair? Be careful. All right. Brother Dean, you ready to go? You roll that, and we'll... National Bible Publishing Month. Bearing precious seed. Uh, in a very, very important way for bearing precious seed, and that is through National Bible Publishing Month. For the last 43 years, Bearing Precious Seed has been concerned about publishing the Word of God in the languages of the people and getting it into their hands so that they can have what you and I have had all of our lives. Behind me is our web press. We uh, use that to print the Word of God. Uh, we have on our press right now, we're running uh, scriptures right here today. And uh, this is because of people like you who have given and provided funding for that. Now, the press is important, the equipment is important. All the things you find here at Bearing Precious Seed is of vital importance. But folks, we can't run Bibles, we can't meet the needs of missionaries unless we have paper. This roll of paper, these rolls of paper will produce about 400 whole Bibles and about 1800 New Testaments. You know what, you can be a part of that. You can be a part of getting the Word of God to people, you can be a part of providing paper. A roll of paper costs about $625 a roll. And you know what? You can help by providing these rolls so that you can help turn darkness into light. As we're here in the warehouse, I can't help but think about National Bible Publishing Month. As I look around and I see the different languages uh, that Bibles and New Testaments and think of all who've given and sacrificed so that these scriptures can be here. It reminds me 2014, one of the countries that we focused on during National Bible Publishing Month was the country of Sierra Leone. I had the opportunity to be in Sierra Leone when that container arrived, that container that was funded by those that gave towards National Bible Publishing Month and to see the smiles on the people's faces, uh, to see the joy that was there when they got a copy of the Word of God. It was an exciting thing. It's something that I can't put into words. In Sierra Leone, there's a great opportunity yet again. Our theme for 2016 for National Bible Publishing Month is turning darkness to light. In the country of Sierra Leone, we have a great opportunity to see this transpire. We're told that there in the military by the head chaplain that it used to be that for every three Muslims in the military, there was one Christian. They're now telling us that for every three Christians, there's one Muslim. Previously, we took scriptures like these for the military. When we got there, they asked us if we could provide similar Bibles for every member of the national police force in the entire country. We have the opportunity now not only to influence the military who were there, but also the police force and a large percentage of the leadership of this country can have a copy of the Word of God because men and women, boys and girls will give towards this project in National Bible Publishing Month. There's a great opportunity available to us in the country of Sierra Leone. We don't know how long the window is going to be open. We don't know how much time that we'll have, but we do know that the Lord is working through His Word to change darkness to light in Sierra Leone. This year's National Bible, we're going to be focusing on four major countries. We're going to be focusing on the uh, Faroe Islands, also the country of Haiti. Uh, we're going to be printing for Sierra Leone and also uh, the uh, Kannada Bible, which is exciting to me. I just came from uh, South India and met with the translator. He says that there are 65 million people that speak the Kannada language and uh, there is such great need for this Bible. We're going to be able to be involved in that project and get the churches there some Bibles. We're going to print 10,000 whole Bibles, 15,000 uh, New Testaments, and this will be used to give to God's people there and to help them in discipleship areas and to help the churches to grow depth in the Scripture. And uh, we need your help this year 
on these four countries that we're focusing on to turn darkness into light. It's a month set aside every year. Is this on, Brother Dean? Um, they do a wonderful job down there at BPS, and uh, and I just thought, did you catch what he said? That area in India, 65 million people, and he said 10,000 Bibles and 15,000 New Testaments. You know that's a drop in the bucket. 25,000 Bibles and New Testaments for 65 million people. Wow. And most of us brought a Bible with us to church, and we've got several more at home we could have brought if we wanted to. We're, we're extremely blessed in the United States of America. We have no idea what it's like to live in a part of the world where you would want to have a Bible and you cannot get one. Uh, so let's give that 600 some dollars for a roll of paper. I believe we could easily get them two rolls of paper and uh, with, with the offering today. And I hope you, if you have that, uh, you can, when the ushers are taking the offering, you can come up and put it in the boxes if you want, or you can put it in the plate, either one tonight. I think we'll be okay. Uh, much of it is in the boxes here. And then, fellas, when you're done, you ought to come up and get the boxes and take that down with you as well. Okay? All right, fellas, let's stand and. We'll have prayer for offering tonight. Father, we thank you for the privilege to give, and thank you, Lord, for bearing precious seed, the ministry you've raised up there in Milford, and for the literally millions of scriptures that have been printed and come off the press that you've given to them. And Father, I pray that not only here, but uh, churches are, uh, across America and literally around the world will uh, get behind this effort to get the Word of God published and get it in the hands of those who've never had a copy of the Word of God in their language. And so, Father, bless the offerings and bless the giving of your people. And, Lord, may it be for the furtherance of the gospel around the world. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Take your Bible this evening for our scripture reading, if you would, please. And turn over to Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59. Isaiah chapter 59, please. We're going to read verses 1 through 14. And we'll read them responsibly, as we normally do, beginning together on verse 1, and then I'll read 2 and alternate till we end together on verse number 14 of Isaiah chapter 59. And as our custom is, let's stand together to read the scripture. All of us standing to read God's word, please. And let's begin together on verse 1. Ready? Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. 
for your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. They hatch cockatrice's eggs and weave the spider's web. He that eateth of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. Their webs shall not become garments, neither shall they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are in their paths. The way of peace they know not, and there is no judgment in their goings. They have made them crooked paths. Whosoever goeth therein shall not know peace. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. We roar all like bears and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off from us. For our transgressions are multiplied before Thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us, and as for our iniquities, we know them. In transgressing and lying against the Lord, and departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. And let's read 14 together also. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. And let's pray. Father, add your blessing to the reading of our Scripture here this evening. And Father, I pray that you would make our hearts ready to receive your word tonight. Father, I thank you for the good music this evening and the good spirit that's in this place. And Father, we need your help now as we open up your word. And I pray that each of us would be focused and we'd listen carefully to what you would want to say to us. I pray, Lord, that none of us would miss the still small voice of the Spirit of God. Use the message in each one of our hearts and lives tonight. Not only as believers and not only as Christians, but as American believers and American Christians. So Lord, help us this evening and open our understanding of your word tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. We're taking our text tonight from verse 14 where it says, Truth is fallen in the street. I believe that with every crisis or crossroad that a nation faces, it either can lead itself to more chaos and more confusion, or it can lead itself to a correction. And I think we're standing in America at a crossroads. I think we're, we're, we're at a point of a crisis in our country. And I believe that the choices that will be made in this coming year are going to determine the destiny of America. If America ends up in the graveyard of civilizations, it will be of her own doing. No one to blame but the people that make up this nation. The Bible says in Psalm 33 verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. And listen, if we, if we do not 
make a substantial change in our country. And, and listen, not, not just in who we elect as leaders, though that is important. That needs to, listen, it, 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 it needs to start in, in not just the White House, but it needs to start in the church house. And the churches need to get themselves where they ought to be right with God. But I believe if that doesn't happen, I think we're going to see some uh, terrorism. I think we're going to see some anarchy. We're going to see some uprisings in our country like we've never seen in the history of our nation. And, un- and, and listen, according to the Bible, it may come a time, in fact, hold your finger there in Isaiah 59 and, and go with me back to 1 Samuel chapter 8. Would you look there for a moment? 1 Samuel chapter 8. This, of course, is Israel who has decided they wanted Saul to be their king. That wasn't, by the way, it wasn't God's plan. He was their leader. They were a theocracy, and they followed God and His prophets. But they wanted a king, and the only reason they wanted a king was be like everybody else. Everybody else does it that way. And so God God allowed them to choose Saul. And He tells them what's going to happen, that He's going to take a tenth of your seed, and He's going to take your men's servants and your maid servants. He's telling them all the things that could happen when you get a king. In verse 18 of 1 Samuel chapter 8, the Lord says, And ye shall cry out in that day, because of your king, which ye shall have chosen you. And the Lord will not hear you in that day. He says, you're, you're, gonna, you're not going to like it. You're, you're not going to enjoy it. But you're going to live with the consequence of your choice. And I think while that, that obviously applies to Israel in that situation, I believe it applies to America in our situation. Listen, the only cure for the crookedness, the only cure for the craziness and the chaos and the confusion that's in America right now, I believe with all my heart, is that book right there. I believe it's the only hope we've got is that we'll get back to the Bible. We'll get back to the Word of God. It's the only beacon of light in a dark day. Several weeks ago, I talked about James Garfield who, by the way, was a lay preacher and a principal of a Christian college who ran for president. In 1880, he was elected president of the United States. He only served six months in office. A lawyer named Charles, I believe it's Guiteau, or Guiteau, became infuriated when his application to be the U.S. ambassador to France was denied. Guiteau believed that God had ordered him to kill the president. And so he stalked the president for several days. And finally, on July 2nd, 1881, Garfield arrived at the Washington Railroad Depot and Guiteau was hiding in the station. And he fired two shots at President Garfield. One grazed his arm, but the other lodged somewhere inside the president's body. They rushed the president to the White House. He never lost consciousness. And for the next 80 days, 16 doctors were consulted regarding the president's condition. The first doctor to treat the president, Willard Bliss, stuck a non-sterile finger into the wound. Sterilization at that time had been taught, but not practiced. He followed this by inserting a non-sterile probing instrument to find the bullet. He never found the bullet, but the false passage that he dug out confused later physicians as to the path of the bullet. So as a result, they concluded the bullet had penetrated the liver and therefore surgery would be of no help, and they said, surely the president will die quickly as a result. And of course, they were wrong. The Army Surgeon General stuck his unwashed finger into the wound, and dug as deep as he could. 
This was followed by the Navy Sur Surgeon General who searched with his finger so deeply that this time he really did puncture the liver. His conclusion, the president would die within 24 hours. But Garfield didn't die the next day. In an effort to find the bullet, they called Alexander Graham Bell in. And he rigged up a metal detector to help find the bullet. And after several passes, he said he'd located the bullet, but it was much deeper than they originally thought. With the president's condition going steadily worse, they decided to cut him open and remove the slug. But they couldn't find it. What Bell had actually located was a spring in the mattress underneath the president. In the end, they managed to take a three-inch wound and turn it into a 20-inch canal that was now heavily infected and oozed more and more pus with each passing day. The deep wound with its massive infection coupled with blood poisoning from the bullet caused the president's heart to weaken. And on September 19, 1881, President Garfield had a massive heart attack and died. Why did he die? At the autopsy, the examiners determined the bullet had lodged itself some four inches from the spine in a protective cavity. Their conclusion, the president would have survived if the doctors would have left him alone. I believe America has a large wound with massive infection. We've got all kinds of doctors, social doctors, philosophical doctors, socialist doctors, humanist doctors, sticking their non-sterile fingers and probing instruments into the wound. But America just gets sicker and sicker every day. They don't get any better. America is getting sicker because she's lacking the right truth the right treatment to treat her wound. And that treatment is the Word of God. What's wrong with getting back to what the founding fathers began the country upon? Which is the Constitution of the United States based, by the way, on the Word of God. Nothing wrong with getting back to the Bible. Isaiah 59 is an amazing chapter. And I'm sure as you read the 14 verses that we read together this evening, you saw some parallels just in reading of what God spoke that, about what they were going through and what we experience in our country. The first thing I want you to point out that He points out to them is bloody hands. Look at verse number 3, will you please? For your hands are defiled with blood. Your fingers with iniquity. In America, listen, we are swimming in a pool of blood. 57 million unborn babies slaughtered in America since 1973. That's over a million every year, my friend. One, by the way, 1 billion and 74 million killed worldwide. You can go to the ruins of Carthage, North Africa. In its pinnacle, Carthage was the queen and mother of all the cities in Africa. It was called the Eternal River of Rome. She was first in power, first in prestige, and first in prosperity. At one point, Carthage wanted for nothing. It was advanced in education. It was advanced militarily. It was advanced in commerce, judges, lawyers. It had everything. Sound familiar? But historian Jim Black said this in his book, When Nations Die. He said, seething with every kind of wickedness, thronging with iniquities, full of riches, but fuller with sin, where men surpass one another in their vileness, of their evil passions, strong enough for themselves, for supremacy and greed and impurity, others enfeebled with wine or gluttony, 
Others crowned with flowers or reeking in perfumes. It is true, but everyone drunk in sin. They also had ornately carved funeral monuments in Carthage. They depicted scenes of infant sacrifice set up in the cemeteries around the city to acknowledge the blood offerings made to their goddesses in exchange for her blessings. The historian says, I remember visiting the cemeteries and seeing the tiny stone coffins of infants who were murdered and burned as sacrifice to the pagan goddess. Thousands of these coffins lined up row after row after row. It was chilling to look at. He said, 20 years after my visit, I still remember the sense of sorrow I felt. And I recall wondering what horrors the mothers and fathers of those innocent victims must have endured at the hands of their demon God. And I asked the question, how is the murder of 57 million innocent babies any different in our day? How is it any different than offering the child sacrifice of that day? Isn't abortion, isn't it our culture's sacrifice to the gods of choice, greed, convenience, materialism? The man who occupies the Oval Office now has, has been, and, and I heard him say it himself, that if one of my daughters ends up getting pregnant, I don't want them punished with a baby. I believe the violence of our day has far surpassed the violence of Noah's day. I believe it's far surpassed King Herod's and Hitler's day. And yet, uh, listen, we're facing a political season, an election cycle that's coming up, and, and yet of all the topics, and there's been, there's been uh, it seems like there's a debate a week. And yet, hardly ever is there a question about the life of innocent children. It's like an issue. They, they feel like, well, the American people don't even care about the issue anymore. We get so used to it that it's not even mentioned. By the way, Planned Parenthood, which has been responsible for nearly 7 million of the abortions in the United States since 1970, but wait a minute, over 3 million of those in the last 10 years. They're averaging somewhere between 320 to 335,000 abortions every year in America. And now, they're harvesting those body parts and selling them. And, and a judge indicts the people who videotapes the catching them red-handed in their wicked and immoral and illegal practice. And they're not harmed. And the ones who did the taping are indicted for a crime. Truth has fallen in the street. That's where we're living. Moses told Israel just before his death, I call heaven and earth to record this day, to record this day, that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. Deuteronomy 30, verse 19. Bloody hands. We have to give an account for that. Don't, don't sit and listen. All it has taken for that to take hold in America is for good people to do nothing. But he didn't just talk about their bloody hands. Look again in chapter 59 and verse number 3. He, he mentions something else. You're, he says, Your hands are defiled with blood and your fingers with iniquity. Your lips have spoken lies. Your tongue has muttered perverseness. Lying lips. We live in a day here in America where sociologists will tell us that it's not a big deal to lie and cheat. Especially it doesn't hurt anybody. From the classroom to the boardroom to the bedroom. 
It seems just like it's a normal thing for people to lie. Become a normal function of society. We've had to endure in, in politics all the time. In fact, the standard uh, joke now is, uh, how do you know if a politician's lying? Because his lips are moving. That's how sad of a state we've come to. Bill Clinton to Hillary Clinton to Donald Trump. It's amazing how wrong behavior and lying and deceit now gets public approval. Chuck Colson writes, Societies are tragically vulnerable when the men and women who compose them lack character. By the way, when you cannot speak without cursing, you're revealing a very weak mind. Years ago, I was taught, and, 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 I, and I saw this, and it, it's so true, that profanity is the strongest expression of a weak mind. Profanity is the strongest expression of a weak mind. Keep that in mind when you're listening to your politicians. He goes on to say, A nation or a culture cannot endure for long unless it's undergirded by common values such as valor, respect for others, and for the law. It cannot stand unless it's populated by people who will act on motives superior to their own immediate interests. It cannot stand unless it's populated by people who will act on motives that are far superior to their own immediate interests. Now, I ask you the question, are we there in America? We are not there. We have people who act on their own immediate interests. We have an out and out socialist unashamedly, unabashedly running to be president of these United States of America. And we have a, and, and by the way, he will win, it looks like, this, new, this primary in New Hampshire. Largely from a group of young people that just say, hey, he's given me this, he's given me this, he's given me this. Do you understand? It's, somebody pays for it? Do, do, we, do, do we don't, we, we, we're not understanding that, that you have to think of the good of the country. And people say, I don't care what the other country does, just so I get what I want. A writer named James Bovard said this, with attention deficit democracy, that's a great term, isn't it? I'm trying to wake up people to how the combination of mass ignorance fear-mongering by the government, and lying politicians is putting our entire system of government in a death spiral. He's right. John Adams, the second president of the United States, said this, Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. If we are not a moral and religious people, this system of government that was set up by the Founding Fathers will not work. When we decided we don't want God and we decided we don't want God's Word and we don't want anything to do with God, we decided we are going to destroy our country. Isaiah 5 verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Ecclesiastes 10.1 Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. And I'll be... Listen, I'll tell you tonight, something is stinking in America. Amen. What brought this on? Several things. Number one, a diet of deception. Verse 5 here in this passage. And by the way, verse 4 is true as well. None call for justice, nor any pleadeth for truth. What are they trusting in? Vanity, Vanity emptiness. And they speak lies and conceive mischief. And they bring forth iniquity. They hatch, verse 5, cockatrices eggs. Cockatrice is just a snake, viper if you will. They weave the spider's web. 
He that eats of their eggs dieth, and that which is crushed breaketh out into a viper. He says the, the pagan philosophies that were present in Isaiah's day, they were, they were simply like, like eggs of a snake, and they were hatching and just bringing forth more snakes. You're feeding on a snake egg diet. And listen, humanism, materialism, relativism, liberalism, all the philosophies of the world are wrapped up in a devilish deception designed to destroy the believer and destroy what once was the greatest country in the world. And it's interesting that he likened it to a serpent because their granddaddy is the serpent called Satan. Think about a teenage girl that cannot get an aspirin at school for a headache, but can get contraception and even an abortion without her mom and dad's permission. That's deception. Just try to, just try to introduce creationism into the classroom in most of the public schools. State schools. I don't think you can call them public schools anymore. But notice the last part of verse 5 that says that when it's crushed, it breaks out into a viper. You think you're crushing it, but it just brings out more. So we have the, 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 the deceit, but we also have a web of wickedness. They spin the spider's web, it says. They weave the spider's web in verse 5. Picture here is Israel, your sin that you're weaving is, is weaving a web for you and you're going to be stuck in your own web. The Bible talks about the cords of our sin and we get held with the cords of our sin. At first we think everything's fine and this isn't hurting us and this isn't so bad and we do it personally and we can do it collectively as a nation. And we think it's alright until it gets binding. I believe our nation's being poisoned every day with a web of wickedness. It's interesting how God refers to it as a web. And one of the greatest places to get poisoned is the worldwide web. And buddy, it can be a web you get caught in. There's over, listen, the number one internet business in America. What is it? Pornography. Far and away. Over one million websites. In a New York City school district, there's a textbook that's used in every high school. And it says, quote, premarital sexual intercourse is acceptable for any sexual orientation if they're involved in a stable, loving relationship. And there's worse things than that. I can tell you my wife recently substituted in a high school class in Hamilton High School, which, is a, which would be considered one of the better school districts in Columbus. And the literature they're reading is, is, is not visual pornography, but it's reading, what do you call that? Reading pornography. Rape described in detail. And here's high schoolers reading this. She went to the principal and said, what, what are they reading this for? And his response is, he checked into it, it's been approved, it's literature. You see, we're, we're living Judges 17.6, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Former Supreme Court Justice Sandra Day O'Connor said from the bench in a case concerning decency, listen carefully, the evolving standards of decency mark the progress of a maturing society. Hey, I got news for you. We don't have evolving standards of decency. There is a standard of decency. There is a standard of what's right and what's wrong. 
God has given it in His Word. The, the, the lie that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden is the devil's lie to Adam and Eve that you should be able to determine what's right and what's wrong. You should be able to determine good and evil. Not God. Up to that point, did Adam and Eve have to decide what's good and what's bad? No, God already told them that. You can eat of all these trees, but you can't eat of this tree. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Satan so says, well, who God think He is? He can determine good and evil. You should determine what's good and evil. And every man does what was right in his own eyes. We've been given a diet of deception, a web of wickedness, and then we find in verses 12 through 14, we have seen a trashing of the truth. The picture he gives us in verses 12 through 14 is that there is a traffic jam in the street. Justice and equity can't get through anymore because something's blocking the street and jamming it up. And you know what it is? It's truth. Truth has fallen. Truth has been knocked down by philosophy and tripped up by dishonest politician and chloroformed by liberal pussyfooting preachers. Peddling poison from the pulpit. Peddling philosophy from the pulpit. Just trying to make everybody feel good and not give us the Word of God. Let me ask you a question. Why did God give us the Bible? It's called the Word of God. It's called the Word of Truth. Sanctify them through Thy Word. Thy Word is truth. Think about it. God gave us the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of truth. He put us in a church. He said the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. God's trying to tell us something. He said, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is the only tool that can set somebody free from a society where they've been fed a diet of deception and a web of wickedness, and they've been, been, had the truth trampled on. Amen. The only thing that changes somebody is the truth of God. Amen. Listen, the only weapon we have in the, sword, in, in the armor of God, the only weapon we have is the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Amen. Someone said in our witnessing class tonight, somebody said, well, what do you... What do you do with someone who doesn't believe the Bible? You know what you do? You use the Bible. Okay? If, if it is somebody, the Word of God is quick, it's alive, and it's powerful. powerful. Sharpening two-edged sword. Doesn't matter whether someone believes it or not. You use it on them, it'll have an effect on them. I told you about the days of Dwight Moody and R.A. Torrey where they would go over to England and rent the the, the big hall in England, and, and they would have meetings to where they would pack the place out several times a day. And they would advertise that they would hold atheist meetings. Only if you were an atheist were you permitted to come. And they would fill the place up with several thousand men proclaiming, professing to be atheists. You say, well, man, what kind of sermons would they preach? They didn't preach. Well, boy, they must have had some, some strong arguments for, for God. No, they didn't have any arguments. Say, so what did they do? You know what they did? They gave them Scripture. The only challenge they gave them was they challenged each of them to take the Bible and read the Gospel of John. And John's one of the few books in the Bible, both the Gospel of John and 1 John, that tells you exactly why it was written. In John 20, in verse number 31, John says, These are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through His name. Why was John written? That ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life in His name. And it would be incredible how the, the week, a week later, men would come back. 
not to the atheist meeting, but to the regular meeting who confess their faith in Jesus Christ. What happened? The truth of the Word of God. The power of the truth. We have something to can Listen, we have something. You have something right here. We have something right here that slays the snake and destroys the spider. It defeats the enemy every time. Jesus, when confronted with the enemy, always said three times, it is written. He gave the Word of God. The truth of God's Word. Now listen, no wonder Proverbs tells us to buy the truth and sell it not. Don't give up on your truth. Don't sell out. Can I just say this? Well, I'm going to say it anyway. I am so disappointed at evangelical Christians. And I know that takes a broad spectrum. But by, by and large, when you use that term, you're saying those who would believe that salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ and would believe the Bible to be the Word of God. Lining up to support Donald Trump. You're, you're not going to be... Listen, you cannot support what he stands for. Casinos and strip clubs and, and all sorts of other things and his, his vulgar language and say, I stand for that book right there. I stand for truth. There's a disconnect somewhere that's not right you've sold out if you're doing that you've sold out it's kind of like listen it at the fellow who who met the lady at the party and 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 offered said hey would you go home with me for uh ten dollars and she slapped him in the face he said now would you go home for me for a million dollars and she began to think about it. He said, what do you think I am? He said, I think we just established what you were. We're just negotiating the price. Hmm? What would it take for you to sell out? Sell out your convictions. Sell out what you believe. And There are those who have sold out, I think, because of the money that Mr. Trump has. But listen, you, you say, well, preacher, I just stay neutral in all those things. That's the problem. That's the problem. In America, someone said, I don't know how accurate this is, but they say we have around 7 million humanists, but we're supposed to have 180 million Christians, at least in name. I'm not sure that's in practice. But if that's true, if that's even near true, how are we losing the battle? How come we're not winning the war? And the reason we're not winning the war is we are quiet. We don't stand up for what's right. It was Nietzsche in the, Nietzsche in the 19th century that challenged the foundations of Christianity when he said, God is dead. God remains dead and we've killed them. I think people believe that in America. Uh, Felicia was talking in 530 class. I know that really surprises you. But um, she was sharing about uh, a place she goes in a, in a shelter. Uh, not now, I think, where they lived before. To just spend time with God and to pray quiet place and she was there praying one day and when she sensed people were there and she opened her eyes up and I think she was surrounded by was it junior high age boys on bicycles and they're all looking at her and of course their normal question is what are you doing and she said I'm praying you know what they ask who are you praying to and she said I'm praying to God you know what their next question was Who's God? Hey, that's, that's not in India. That's, that, that's the United States of America. Who's God? Why? For their, for their 13 or 14 years on earth, 
They haven't been taught about God. They don't know who that is. She had the opportunity to get some material and tell them who God was. Amen. When I was in college, I had the opportunity to preach and just my freshman year, 19 years of age, but it's, it's interesting. The song the choir sang tonight was one of the messages preaching on the Bible and I memorized that song. The, and, and, of course, my freshman year, 19 years old, that was just a few years ago. <laughs> few is a relative term. The Bible stands. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted mid the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal and they glow with the light sublime. And on and on. I, uh, the Bible stands though the hills may tumble. It will firmly stand though the earth may crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation for the Bible stands. I think all, listen, what we need in America are God's people to stand upon God's Word. When you read Ephesians chapter 6 and the armor of God and the spiritual warfare that goes on, you read several times, having done all, stand. Stand. Stand therefore. Listen, it talks about being girt with, the, with truth and having the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Oh, my friend, listen. Let's, 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 let's buy the truth and let's sell it not. It's time for God's people to stand up for the truth of God. Unashamedly. Let's, let's let them know the Bible still stands. And we're not ashamed of it. That song, that one verse, I think it's the last verse. It says, the Bible stands every test we give it for its author is divine. By grace alone I expect to live it and to prove it and to make it mine. Why don't we make that our prayer tonight? Amen. Let's live the Bible that we know. It's the only hope our country's got. Friend, this, this is it. If, if we don't rise up and speak the truth and get, get some kind... Listen... Not only get our churches based on the truth and founded on the truth and speaking the truth and going forth with the gospel and, and, and standing, listen, and stopping the lies and stopping the deception and, and ask God to give us a man in the White House who will seek him and will seek to guide his life according to the Word of God, we're done. The United States of America, as we know it, Will, will not exist. And our children won't have it near the place to grow up in that we've grown up in. This young man won't have a chance. We've, all it takes for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Let's not bury our head any longer. Let's stand for the truth. Let's stand for the truth of God. Let's stand together, shall we? Father, thank You for Isaiah 59, for the truth that you gave us here. Lord, it, it had to be with a heavy heart that you spoke these words. As you watched your people allow truth and justice to fall in the street. No one cried for truth. No one cries out for justice. And Lord, I pray that there would be a group of people in this room that would cry out for truth and cry out for justice. And Lord, that we would put on the whole armor of God, that we may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Amen. Lord, we'll take our stand on the truth. That by grace alone, we, we expect to live it, and to prove it, and to make it mine. Father, I pray that you'll help us to stand for the truth. Save our country. Help us to do our part as believers and as citizens of this country.
to call our nation back to God. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. In a moment, I'll finish the prayer and we'll have our invitation. I wonder this evening if God spoke to your heart. You say, preacher, I, I don't want to be part of the problem. I do want to be part of the solution. And by God's grace, I'm going to stand for the truth. I'm not going to be part of the silent majority. I'm going to speak for the truth. I'm going to pray for God to call our country back to Him. And at every opportunity that God gives me, I'm going to stand for the truth. Pastor, I'm going to do my part to not remain neutral in this battle. Pastor, pray for me this evening. Will you slip your hand up? Amen. God bless you. Praise the Lord. You may put them down. Heavenly Father, I thank you for speaking to our hearts tonight. And Lord, I pray that we would bow our knee before you this evening and ask you to do a work in us and through us on behalf of our country. And I pray, Lord, that we would lift up the truth. That once again, the church, the church of God, would become the pillar and ground of the truth. A place where people could come and hear the truth of God's Word. Not what they want to hear, but what God says from His Word. So Father, have Your way in this invitation. Hear our prayer tonight as we bow our knee to You. On behalf of ourselves and our country. And I'll thank you for it. With your heads bowed, our pianist is going to begin to play. Bob's going to sing a hymn of invitation. If God has spoken to your heart this morning. Respond to him or this evening. Let's bow the knee, shall we? Search me, O oh God, and know my heart today. I pray, see if there be some wicked way in me, cleanse me from every sin and set me sin fulfill thy word and make me pure within fill me with fire where once I burned with shame grant my desire to magnify Thy name, Lord, take my life and make it wholly Thine. Fill my poor heart with Thy great love divine. Take all my will. And self and pride. I now surrender, Lord, in me abide. O Holy Ghost, revival comes from thee. Send a revival. Lord.
just a minute you know don't fall into the trap of just who people say well doesn't matter what we do God's going to put in whoever he wants let me read you a verse from Hosea chapter 8 verse number 4 the Lord said they have set up kings but not by me you know what you can make a choice and God will say okay that's who you want that's who you can have Okay? Don't, don't think that whoever goes in, it's God's will for him to be there. I don't think it was God's will for Saul to be there. That was the people's choice. It wasn't God's choice. And God will, God will let you have that. I think, he, I think he's done that to us for the last eight years. He let us have who we wanted. And the person we got in the White House is largely because people of God did not do anything we did not do anything so let's do our part and let's do what we can spiritually you know uh, what what changes um, what what ought to change a person's politics not not listen and and not Republican or Democrat but what will change you is that book right there the truth ought to change you. Don't, don't have a disconnect when it comes to your politics and that book. That, that affects every area of our life. It, it affects how we live each and every day. It, 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 it's, it's, it's us. Okay? And that's who we are. And I'm glad I'm that way. I wouldn't want to live any other way. It's a grand thing to be a Christian. It's the best thing I know. Amen? Let's pray together. Shall we? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you, Lord, for, again, these words through Isaiah to Israel, but to us as well. And Father, I'm praying tonight for the United States of America, and I'm praying for our country. I'm praying that we would be the salt and the light that you've called us to be. We would take our responsibility seriously. So, Lord, I pray you'd help us to stand for truth. Thank you for giving us the truth. Thank you for people who gave today to turn the light of truth on for many in this world who are in darkness. I pray you'd bless the printing of bearing precious seed. The Bibles, the New Testaments, as they go out, may they turn many to righteousness. And, Lord, we realize that we won't know the fruit from what was given today until we get to eternity and we get to heaven. But Lord, we pray your blessing upon it. Now dismiss us with your care, Lord. Make us mindful of your presence as we leave this place tonight. Thank you for another wonderful day in the house of the Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing. What are we going to sing? <laughs> Let's do the joy of the Lord is my strength. It's I Love My Church Month. We'll close with that. All right? You got it? The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. I go to Bible Baptist and I love my church. Oh, the joy of the Lord is my strength. God bless you. You are dismissed.